Switching to wedge formation, I think. Oh, he's going for it. Oh, wow. Look at this. Oh, and they're slipping right through over here. Charging straight in. Wavering on that side as well. Did he break through yet? Oh my god, this entire Date front line over here is just evaporating. And look at that Cav. And wedge formation just running wild. They're on the loose. No! 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 Hey, I am Triple Z Hacker, and welcome to part 2 of my Total War Shogun 2 unit ability guide. If you haven't yet, be sure to watch part 1 of this guide, where I cover the rest of the game's abilities. As always, if you love Shogun 2, then you'll love my channel, so don't forget to subscribe. In this glorious game, unit abilities have a vital impact on the course of battles, and throughout the video, I intend to tell you everything you need to know about them. With that, let's begin. The first group of abilities I'm going to cover are Cavalry abilities. In Shogun 2, Cav is often viewed as weaker because of their tendency to be decimated by spear units, yet Cav still play an important role in Shogun 2 battles for their mobility and morale shock, so don't underestimate their potential. The first cavalry ability is Second Wind, which is a rare ability used by Great Guard, Onabushi, Yari Hero, Marathon Monks, and by Mountain Samurai Hero in the Rise of the Samurai campaign. I chose to include this ability with Cav to have a more even distribution of abilities between each parts of this guide, so yes, infantry units do have this ability as well. Anyways, the Second Wind ability reduces fatigue of the activating unit and affects up to three friendly units nearest to them that are within the activating unit's area of influence which is displayed here. Friendly units include allied units on your side, so that is including teammates if you're playing in multiplayer, or even AIs that are helping you in the campaign. Now, a second wind inspires these units to put every last effort into battle, restoring a degree of stamina. The fatigue or stamina level does change value, but this is not indicated by a stat, but instead by the black pop-up card that appears whenever you hover over a unit, as you can see here. Now this image shows the actual value for each of the corresponding fatigue statuses of a unit. The second wind ability grants a fatigue reduction of minus 11,000. So taking that into account, the optimal usage of second wind would be when units immediately reach the very tired status at 10,800, because the ability would grant the affected units the fresh fatigue status which you can see here in this little clip that's an example. Of course, it's nearly impossible to have perfect timing like that, but ideally you want to use second wind when you notice units are either tired or very tired to get the most out of the fatigue reduction. If you struggle to achieve that timing, then don't worry, just remember that it's best to use the ability after units have endured a sustained period of combat. Speaking of timing, the second wind ability has a 2 minute and 30 second cooldown at the start of the battle, the ability's effect lasts for 40 seconds and has another cooldown period for 5 minutes until you can use it again. Second Wind may not be as powerful as other abilities I've covered, but it could enable your units to finally break through frontline defenses or help you snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. The next cavalry ability is Wedge Formation, which is shared by all melee cav units aside from the general, who can unlock the formation with the cavalry commander trait in the campaign. This formation improves the penetration of enemy lines, but will kill less enemies, and I think it's extremely underrated. The formation doesn't change any stats whatsoever, but has tremendous potential when used in the right situation. Now, there's multiple benefits to using Wedge Formation. As you saw in the intro from a battle replay by Regular Ghost, it is great to use when exploiting gaps in enemy lines to sneak through with your cav because they're formation is now condensed, so you can slip through easily. You can see just how quickly these frontline infantry units route, and you can see how the cav also just makes it through the flanks and is able to hammer an anvil and destroy the rest of the enemy front line. The other bonus to wedge formation is that in cav versus cav fights, it can be rather effective, but the cav that is using wedge formation is vulnerable to being encircled or flanked, so keep that in mind when using it. Regardless, standard charges are more effective for raw killing potential, but if you want to slip through and penetrate enemy positions or disrupt formations, then wedge is the way to go. For further info on wedge formation, also check out Volan's video that I linked in the description where he extensively tests and covers all the aspects of it. The next cap ability in this guide is really straightforward, and that is the dismount or mount ability, which literally does exactly as the ability's name says. Any cav unit possesses the ability to dismount from their horses and remount throughout the entire battle. Typically, you don't want to dismount your cav units in battle because you lose their mobility. However, dismounting does enable some benefits like climbing walls, for instance in sieges, or capturing key buildings in multiplayer, but it does come at a cost to their stats, which they regain once they've remounted their 
their horses. As you can see in the following examples, Katana Cav when dismounted becomes an expensive Katana Samurai unit, and Yari Cav becomes an expensive Yari Samurai unit. Still, there are also additional unique benefits to dismounting your Cav units. For instance, whenever your Cav unit gets caught off guard and charged by an opposing unit of Cav, you can quickly order them to get off their horses. When dismounted, Yari Cav retains their 15 bonus versus Cav stat, whereas the mounted unit's bonus versus Cav is useless because it's no longer fighting a Cav unit but an infantry one instead. Again, this is a really advanced technique, typically seen in multiplayer, but it can be helpful for you potentially in your campaigns. Additionally, as you can see in this next clip, whenever cav units are dismounted, they have a fresh fatigue status, even if they were once very tired while on their horses. Which again is a really crazy exploit, but still an interesting thing to know about dismounting your cav units. The important downside though to consider when dismounting cav units is that horses can be spooked and run away due to being so close to the combat. This means your expensive cav unit could be stuck as an overpriced infantry unit for the remainder of the battle, so just be careful. The next cav ability I'm going to cover is quite an interesting one, and that is Swooping Crane. This ability is a skirmish tactic used by horse archer units or bow cav to harass their targets with a constant barrage of arrows. The ability arranges them into a circular formation where they move constantly which drains their stamina. If the bow cav unit is positioned within a range of more than one enemy unit, the ability will result in a firing arc of 360 degrees. This means that they can pretty much shoot in any direction they want to as long as there's enemy units within range. Also, this ability can be used in conjunction with skirmish mode to keep horse archers away from melee situations. As you can see in the following clips, it's really cool to watch bow-cav units perform this ability. Personally, I don't tend to use Swooping Crane much with bow-cav units. I prefer to keep them in loose formation and micromanage them as skirmish mode isn't as effective in Shogun 2 in comparison with other Total War games. However, I'll get into that later in the guide. Still, the ability can be effective when bow-cav are under enemy bow fire, and you might want to use it if there's multiple units within their range and it's early in the battle. Additionally, it can be helpful if the bow cav are off doing their own thing and you have, you know, trouble micromanaging all the units because Shogun 2 battles happen really quickly and you might want to take your focus elsewhere besides just messing around with your bow cav on one side of the battlefield. The next group of abilities I'm going to cover are ranged unit abilities, which can be some of the trickiest and confusing to use in the game, yet they're all still quite devastating. The first ranged ability I'm going to cover is one that is present in every single Total War game. Skirmish Mode. Shared battle missile units in Shogun 2, this mode can be toggled on and off throughout the battle and keeps ranged units at a safe distance away from the enemy. Basically, the ranged unit will automatically attempt to retreat when threatened. Although it seems like a practical mode to enable, in reality, I find it better to manually retreat missile units, as usually in skirmish mode, they can potentially retreat too late or get caught in the melee. Additionally, when you manually order them, you can control where and when they retreat, whereas with skirmish mode, they act on their own. As you can see in this clip, these ranged units with skirmish mode will continuously retreat if they are threatened in the slightest regard. Of course, this is a practical mode to enable, as I mentioned earlier, so if you struggle with micromanaging your ranged units, feel free to enable skirmish mode as it can be a safeguard in case you forget about your ranged units in the midst of battle. Another ability shared by all ranged units and present in every single Total War game is Fire at Will. Now this ability does exactly what it says. This allows units to fire at enemies in a range when they see fit and can be toggled on and off throughout the battle. Now the effort of constantly firing and reloading does fatigue your ranged units at a faster rate and they will use their ammo quickly but not wisely. Fire at will is typically an ability I use in order to lessen the micromanagement of range units. Matchlocks in particular I find are better suited for fire at will as targeting specific units with them can lead to significant delays in shooting volleys or even have the matchlocks just run towards them and get caught into melee. Sometimes it is advantageous to toggle off fire at will though so that way you avoid friendly fire as that does cause a significant morale penalty to your units. With bow units it's typically better to target specific units especially ones with low armor like Ashigaru or monks as opposed to well-armored units like Naginata Samurai for instance. Now targeting with range units can be rather tricky as I mentioned briefly with the matchlocks sometimes the missile unit will just run towards the enemy unit and not even start firing even when they're in range. This is really important especially when it comes to using gun cav like the Donderbus cav for instance with their low range because they often do get caught in melee since they're not shooting even though they're in range. 
My advice with basically fire at will and targeting and missile units in general is that just always be aware of what your ranged units are shooting at and correct them when necessary during the battle. The next ranged ability is fire arrows, which all bow units can use. Fire arrows or flaming arrows are obviously more powerful than normal arrows and can naturally cause flammable objects to catch fire. What a surprise, right? Now at the start of the battle, this ability's cooldown period is determined by the tier of the bow unit. Bow Ashigaru and Bow Samurai, there's a 45 second cooldown period. For Bow Warrior Monks, it's only 35 seconds. And for Bow Heroes, it's only 25 seconds. After this ability has been activated, the same occurs for the second cooldown period. 5 minutes for Bow Ashigaru and Samurai, 4 minutes and 30 seconds for Bow Warrior Monks, and 4 minutes for Bow Heroes. An important thing to keep in mind is that fire arrows only last for a single volley, so it's best to use this ability sparingly and in the right situation. Also, remember that fire arrows cannot be used in wet weather conditions. Flaming arrows are really beneficial in sieges because they can engulf enemy missile towers in flames, reducing them to ashes, thereby allowing you to take the castle a lot more easily. Additionally, in Shogun 2 multiplayer, I've also seen key buildings destroyed by fire rockets, so perhaps there's the potential to purposely catch them on fire in the hopes of eliminating their bonuses with this ability as well. One of the most underrated ranged abilities is Whistling Arrows. This ability is used by Bow Warrior Monks and Bow Heroes only. Once activated, the next volley of arrows fired will have a sound that has a detrimental effect on the morale, melee attack, and reload rate of any units that the arrows fly over, which include both friend and foe. The exact numbers of these effects are minus 3 melee attack, minus 35 reload skill, and a morale level reduction, so for example going from encouraged to concerned. I don't know the exact numbers for the morale statuses, I'll have to unpack the game at some point, but I will make a video covering morale in the future. Also, the debuffs from Whistling Arrows do last for about a minute. Now, like Fire Arrows, Whistling Arrows is only available for a single volley, so use it wisely. At the start of the battle, the ability has a 35 second cooldown for Bow Warrior Monks and a 25 second cooldown for Bow Heroes until it can be used. Once activated, there's another cooldown period for about 4 minutes and 30 seconds for Bow Warrior Monks and 4 minutes for Bow Heroes until it can be used again. The debuffs from Whistling Arrows do stack with other abilities that have detrimental effects, such as War Cry. <laughs> So it can help instigate mass routes and shatter opposing units with the right timing. Just be careful not to fire over your own units, otherwise you'll get those nasty effects too. The last ability I'll cover for this part of the guide is Melee Mode. Which is technically not an ability, so think of this as an honorable mention. Melee mode is a very important aspect of all ranged units, as it enables them to switch their secondary melee weapons to defend themselves and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This mode is beneficial particularly to ranged cav units who have the potential to route enemies with flank charges or support in the melee engagements. Additionally, they can also run down fleeing enemy troops, and it's really sweet to see them fire a volley and then swap weapons as they charge them down. I use this mode quite often for my ranged units, and it's an important thing for you to remember to use in your battles as well. This concludes part 2 of my unit ability guide. I do apologize for the delay in uploading this. I know a lot of you have been looking forward to the rest of the guide, and it was very time consuming to make, so I also had to split the guide up once again into a third part. But don't worry, I will be uploading that shortly with the rest of the ranged abilities as well as naval abilities. Also, there will be a future guide on the abilities in Fall of the Samurai as well. Now, I do hope you all found this second part of the guide entertaining and informative. As always, thank you for watching and take care.